Welcome to another edition of Sector Spotlight. My name is Chris Kalitra and I'm joined in the studio by Financials and Housing Sector Head Josh Steiner. If you have any questions, please submit them in the comment box below the video player. Uh, and without further ado, Josh, take it away. Great. Well, thanks, Chris, and uh, thanks everybody for taking the time to uh, join us uh, on this Tuesday afternoon. Um, so what we thought we would do is uh, do a little bit of a spotlight here on uh, the U.S. housing market. And um, what I've got in terms of slides is essentially uh, 20 or 30 slides that are actually taken directly out of our second quarter themes uh, deck, which we do uh, quarterly. So uh, let's sort of jump in here um, and give you a little bit of a, I guess, an intro into uh, both how we think about the housing market and uh, where the housing market stands. Um, so on slide two here, basically this is sort of uh, what we call the, uh, the Hedge Eye Housing Compendium, which really breaks down the fundamental uh, housing market into really four categories. So we've got uh, measures of price, uh, measures of volume on both the existing and uh, new home side, as well as some miscellaneous categories. And what I would really point out here is uh, the sort of preponderance of green in the uh, home price category. In other words, uh, this is sort of a, a simple heat map concept, uh, green being sequential improvement, red being sequential deterioration. So uh, what you tend to see in the housing market is that uh, it, it's autocorrelated. And so it tends to self-reinforce on the way up and on the way down. And uh, when the cycle is improving, you tend to see a lot of green, as you, for the most part, see here. Uh, whereas when it's uh, deteriorating, obviously, as it was, circa 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, um, you would just see a, a real bloodbath of red here. Um, if we look quickly at uh, price performance, and again, this is from our uh, theme stack uh, a couple weeks ago uh, on slide three, but you know, the big picture here, uh, we'll actually start with the bottom of this chart, is the year-to-date performance uh, shows that um, housing's been among, uh, if not the best, uh, performing category across the market. And uh, so we've got the uh, S&P 500 uh, housing index, the S15 home series, as well as the ITB and XHB uh, housing related ETFs here. Uh, so up about, depending on the index, 10 to 20% year to date. Uh, the performance so far in the second quarter has definitely been less robust, uh, but uh, still generally uh, tracking towards the, uh, towards the top of the different uh, sector categories there. So if we move on here to um, look at a, a little bit under the hood in terms of uh, what's actually generating performance within the housing sector, uh, without a doubt, it's the home builders. Uh, so home builders up 22% uh, on an absolute basis uh, through the middle of uh, May when we put this together. Home improvement chains, really Home Depot and Lowe's, uh, up uh, 16, 17%. Uh, and then it falls off pretty sharply. Still positive performance, but anywhere from two to eight percent returns, uh, depending on whether you're looking at the mortgage insurers, title insurers, building products, uh, real estate services companies, which are Realogy and Remax, basically the brokers uh, or the REITs. Um, and then in terms of the fundamental market, so on slide five, uh, just a couple quick slides on this. So. You know, bigger picture, uh, year to date, the number of uh, mortgage applications uh, for home purchases have been uh, climbing steadily. And actually, that May 2017 reading uh, of 247 is, in fact, the highest reading uh, in the post-crisis period, uh, notwithstanding one month back in uh, spring of 2010 when the data was distorted by this uh, tax credit pull forward. Uh, basically, the government was giving money to people to buy houses. Um, on the next slide, on slide six, a uh, little bit of a longer snapshot here, uh, 16 or so years, uh, you can see that uh, existing home sales are back up to about 5.71 million units. That's on an annualized basis, uh, season adjusted annualized basis. And um, obviously we're off the low watermark there, which was around three and a half to four million uh, in sort of the belly of the uh, Great Recession, uh, but we still got actually quite a ways yet to climb uh, back to uh, pre-cycle highs. If we go to the next page, uh, slide seven, this is really sort of the big constraint around what's going to allow the housing market to go higher uh, and from a volume standpoint, and that is inventory. Uh, 
Uh, so inventory, we've got this shown on the left here as month supply. Uh, so we're actually below four months of inventory, which uh, to put it in perspective is extremely uh, tight. So you know, the, the general rule of thumb in the uh, market is that six months constitutes a roughly balanced market, i.e. Uh, it's neither a buyer's market nor a seller's market. Um, so down at four months, uh, it is very much a seller's market. Uh, there's very little inventory. Uh, and what's more is if you look on the right side of that chart, you can see that uh, inventory and in, on unit terms is actually still declining on a year-over-year -year basis. So down about six to seven percent year-over-year. You have to look at it year-over-year -year because uh, seasonality uh, is not accounted for in the inventory numbers. Um, they're not seasonally adjusted and they do tend to wax and wane uh, depending on what point in the year. So listings tend to rise in the spring and summer and then they tend to fall uh, in the uh, winter months. So uh, if we go to uh, the new home market here on slide eight, we can take a quick look uh, at what's going on here. So single family uh, housing starts and permits are obviously climbing, um, basically growing. Starts up 6% uh, year over year, permits up 13% uh, year over year. If we look at the multifamily uh, market, however, on the next page, slide nine, uh, it's rather a different story. So uh, multifamily had actually been uh, really the driver of construction growth uh, post the crisis uh, up until basically a year ago. Uh, and now for the past year, multifamily uh, has basically been sideways. And so single family, very much still growing. Multifamily, uh, pretty stagnant at this point. So on slide 10, uh, if we take a step back and we look now at total starts, which is obviously single family plus multifamily, uh, here we've got data that goes back about 50 years. And essentially what we're calling out are prior cycle tops and uh, prior cycle troughs. And really just sort of measuring up the asymmetry between further upside potential versus uh, downside potential based on where we are in the cycle. And as you can see on the right side of this chart, uh, there's about two to one upside downside, meaning uh, it would take about another 70% increase in the amount of construction uh, that we have currently to get us back up to around 2 million units, which is historically around where uh, construction cycles have tended to peak, uh, versus uh, about 29% downside to average trough levels uh, seen over the last uh, four cycles. Um, and this is important because the thing to remember about housing, as I said earlier, it's auto-correlated. Cycles tend to move, as cycles do, from trough to peak and peak to trough, not from trough to median and then, uh, or midpoint, and then back again. Um, next page, slide 11, uh, home prices. Uh, this is really sort of the release valve for that tight inventory dynamic, and I'll actually come back to this in a minute. But the point is that uh, the rate of change, year over year rate of change in uh, home prices, uh, and this is using the Case Shiller 20 city uh, benchmark as a barometer, uh, home prices are accelerating. So in terms of sort of the, uh, I guess the sentiment side of things, um, there's a few different ways that this is measured. Uh, one of which is this Fannie Mae uh, Home Purchase Sentiment Index, the HPSI. Um, you know, good news is that HPSI has been uh, steadily climbing. Uh, it really sort of raced up immediately after the election there, uh, pulled back a bit, uh, and is now sort of climbing again. Uh, so uh, that seems to be pretty favorable. Uh, on the next side, uh, or slide, um, if you look instead at, so the uh, Fannie Mae survey basically surveys uh, would-be home buyers and would-be home sellers. Uh, whereas this next slide, slide 13, actually shows uh, builder confidence. Uh, so this is a survey of builders. And basically, uh, they asked them three questions. They asked them, um, how is uh, current uh, traffic uh, and how are uh, current sales? And what are your expectations uh, for sales six months from now? And they basically meld those three different uh, questions into this, uh, what they call the housing market index, or HMI. So this is a monthly survey put out by the National Association of Home Builders. Obviously, we're at a new cycle peak here, as the chart shows, of 70. Um, you know, on the one hand, uh, maybe it's a little disconcerting that the level of sort of optimism on the part of builders is actually back at levels around where prior cycles have peaked. Uh, what I would come back to is that slide earlier, uh, which showed that there's still obviously a lot of uh, upside relative to downside based on the amount of uh, new construction that's taking place. So on 14, you know, one of the things that I think 
surprises people a fair amount, you know, especially uh, in some of you know, these markets that frankly are a little bit more stretched, is this idea that uh, at a national level, the affordability of the housing market is still incredibly compelling uh, to buy. Um, and so slide 14, basically what we have here is uh, the last 30 years of data. And what it shows is the ratio of the median mortgage payment to the median rent payment. Uh, and what you can see is that in prior cycle peaks, uh, mortgage payments have tended to be around double uh, what rental payments have been uh, at the median. Uh, whereas at cycle troughs, uh, they've tended to be around parity. Um, and that's basically where we are today, down at 105%. We are off the troughs of 85, but obviously we're well below uh, prior cycle highs of 195 or 200. Uh, so there's quite a lot of upside, actually, um, from a cycle standpoint uh, on that basis. And then if we go to 15, uh, the other sort of convention is to look at affordability through the lens of uh, the median mortgage payment relative to median income. And uh, what you can see here is a similar phenomenon that we were looking at before, where typically uh, housing expenses uh, tend to peak out in sort of the 37 to 40 percent of income uh, range. Uh, and then they tend to trough in the sort of 20 to 25 percent range. Uh, so right now we're at about 26, 27 percent. Uh, I've broken this chart into sort of color-coded quintiles uh, to keep it pretty simple. Basically green is good, red is bad, uh, and then when you're in the blue it really depends on sort of which way you're going. So if you're on the way up, uh, that's still favorable, even if you're in blue. If you're on the way down, <laughs> that's still unfavorable. Uh, for reasons we've been talking about. So anyway, the good news is uh, what this essentially means is that there's an embedded long-term uh, structural tailwind here, uh, meaning that until we get up into the orange and really even into the red zone, uh, there is going to be a tailwind at the back of uh, the housing market. And that, as you can see, is probably going to run for quite a bit uh, of time. So a few of the things that are sort of going on uh, under the hood in terms of um, credit availability and underwriting so if we look at 16, um, this is uh, what's called the MCAI, or the Mortgage Credit Availability Index. Uh, it is also put out by the Mortgage Bankers Association, uh, comes out monthly. And as you can see on the chart, basically since sort of mid-2011 uh, to where we are now, uh, it's been a pretty good improvement. It's basically moved up from around 100 or so. It's now sort of in the low 180s. So Obviously, uh, that's good. Uh, the availability of credit has generally been improving. However, if you go to slide 17, um, and this is sort of <laughs> the trick of graphics, right, uh, is that you know, when you zoom out a little bit, uh, you get a little bit more perspective, uh, let's say, on what that amount of improvement actually means in sort of a longer historical context. And basically what it means is not a whole heck of a lot. So in other words, uh, this chart now goes back to mid-04, back when this index was a little inside of 400, obviously uh, peaked at 900 when basically anybody uh, could get a mortgage, um, and obviously lots of people shouldn't have. But the point is, underwriting is a, a pendulum, and it swings back and forth. Underwriting's too tight, underwriting's too loose. Obviously, it was way too loose uh, back in circa 2005, 2006, when the MCII was 8, 900. Uh, obviously, it was way too tight uh, by 2010, 2011, when the MCII was 100. So we've come up uh, into the low 180s. Uh, I think uh, a normal underwriting environment is going to be closer to 250 to 300. Uh, so there's a long way to go yet on that front. Um, and then on slide 18, uh, there's a fair amount going on here. Let me try and explain uh, briefly. Uh, basically, what we looked at is a uh, pretty long time series of data here, 50 years. Uh, we looked at the amount of single-family existing home uh, sales turnover, uh, basically volume of single-family homes sold, relative to the number of households in the U.S. And uh, what's sort of interesting about it, well, there's a couple things that are interesting about it, uh, but basically it, it too follows this uh, cyclical pattern. Um, you can sort of see where we're at right now relative to sort of the longer-term trend, which is uh, that dashed line there in the middle. Uh, we've got some standard deviation lines sort of set above and below that just to kind of frame it up. Um, but the point is, you know, if you think that this is uh, a cycle that will play out uh, like most cycles do over an elongated period of time, uh, then it's not unreasonable to think that we're going to uh, slowly but steadily sort of traject up to 
at least that first standard deviation line, which would be 4.86% uh, turnover relative to households. Uh, and that would get you about 26, 27% uh, increase from where we are now in terms of uh, the existing home turnover. Um, and you can see that in that little table at the bottom there. Um, and the other thing I would point out with this is that uh, this does not actually assume any forward household growth, uh, which is a very conservative assumption since households are in fact growing uh, at a rate of around a million uh, per year, or right around 1%. So if you sort of said, you know, we thought we would sort of get back to plus one standard deviation over a five to 10 year time frame, uh, that would add basically five to 10% uh, to this 26, 27% number. So something to keep in mind. Um, in the short term, uh, on this next page, uh, there is going to be a little bit of a, um, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of a, uh, a little bit of a gimme almost on the part of uh, the credit bureaus. Uh, basically, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion, the big three uh, U.S. credit bureaus, um, are all going to begin to uh, no longer report uh, tax liens. So federal tax liens, state li tax liens, as well as civil judgments. And there's actually quite a few people in the country who have tax liens. Uh, on their credit reports. And uh, by these estimates, around 12 million uh, people actually have tax lien um, uh, things on their credit report, which is going to go away. And so the good news is for about 700,000 people, uh, you're going to get anywhere from a uh, 40 to 60 point bump in your uh, FICO score. And uh, for another roughly 11 million, uh, you'll get something like a 20 uh, point bump. Uh, and that matters because uh, basically once you get down under 620, uh, for mortgage underwriting, you're what's con considered subprime, uh, and that makes it a lot more difficult uh, as well as more expensive to get a mortgage. So if your credit scores are going to go up, and obviously most of these people are people who are sort of on that hairy edge to begin with, uh, this is going to have a little bit of a, uh, a positive uh, bump associated with it in the short to intermediate term. If we go to this next page, slide 20, um, this is more of like what I would call the deep threat, um, which is that uh, if you think about where most of uh, mortgage underwriting in the U.S. still comes from, it basically comes from Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and FHA. So uh, the GSEs, uh, as well as the government through the FHA, still account for around 90% of all mortgage originations. Um, and what's sort of interesting about uh, the GSEs, Fannie and Freddie, is that all of their underwriting uh, plumbing, uh, so to speak, uh, incorporates uh, FICO scores. So Fair Isaac uh, credit scoring is what powers all of these underwriting engines for 90% of the mortgage market. So uh, again, these three credit bureaus, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion, many years ago created uh, essentially a competitor to Fair Isaac, to FICO, uh, and they called it Vantage Score. And Vantage Score's claim to fame is that it allegedly scores uh, about 35 million more Americans than does FICO. Uh, and it does this by incorporating what are called non-traditional uh, credit uh, data. So things like rental payment history, uh, cell phone uh, payment history, uh, utility payment history, and so forth. Um, and what's interesting is that a lot of these people who would potentially uh, qualify for a mortgage if Vantage Score was incorporated into uh, Fannie Freddie or FHA underwriting, um, a lot of these people are really on that sort of lower cusp of uh, credit eligibility, uh, meaning that this would actually matter quite a lot if it were to go through. Uh, so where does this stand? Well, basically, uh, the, what's called FIFA, uh, the Federal Housing and Finance Authority, which is the sort of uh, regulator or overseer of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, has been evaluating now for about a year and a half uh, whether to incorporate Vantage Score, uh, and they're still evaluating. Uh, so there's no sort of definitive timetable around when, well, if and when uh, Vantage Score would be adopted. Probably not any time in the immediate future. However, uh, if in the next one, two, or even three years uh, this does finally go through, uh, it would be a very big event, uh, obviously a bullish catalyst uh, for the housing market because you'd probably get about a million incremental people who are suddenly eligible uh, to uh, obtain a mortgage uh, who were not previously eligible. Um, this next slide, slide 21, I think this is a really important but super simple way of thinking about the housing market. Basically, I've got two things on here. Um, one is uh, basically a measure of the labor market, and that's the blue columns there. Those are initial jobless claims by year uh, back to the late 1960s. And then uh, the black line shows existing uh, home sales um, 
And really, the takeaways are twofold. Uh, one is that if you look at this 50-year period, there's actually only been three sort of epochs uh, within it when the housing markets declined. So that's the early 1980s, early 1990s, and of course, the Great Recession. Uh, now, obviously, during each of those three periods, you had a recession. The labor market deteriorated uh, significantly. Um, and in all three of those instances, uh, housing was actually a direct contributor uh, to the downturn. Uh, what I would also point out, however, is that there have been recessions uh, over this 50-year period that are not reflected in those red columns. Uh, and those are periods during which, obviously, the economy slowed, unemployment worsened, uh, but the housing market actually sort of chugged along and powered through. And the reason I bring that up is because uh, real estate is either the cause of the recession uh, or it isn't. In other words, uh, this next go around is very unlikely to be caused by uh, real estate itself. And so what I would expect is that the housing market will actually power uh, through this pretty well. And remember too that you know, if things are slowing down, then rates are generally easing. Uh, which is itself a catalyst for the housing market because affordability has improved. Um, this next slide, slide 22, is sort of uh, an analysis we did a while back. It's still very true today. Uh, basically what we did is we looked at the sort of um, predictive power of inventory levels in uh, predicting future rates of home price appreciation. And so what we did is we divided up all the inventory readings um, over a 15-year period. Uh, and we put them basically into deciles, meaning the lowest levels of inventory up to the highest levels of inventory. And then we measured uh, subsequent home price performance over 3, 6, 9, 12, and 15 months. And not surprisingly, what you see in this chart is that when inventory is very low, basically when it's in the left side of the chart, uh, you get very strong home price appreciation uh, over the next 3, 6, 9, 12, and 15 months. Conversely, when inventory levels are very high, as they are on the right side of the chart, you get really poor home price performance. Uh, and the reason we show this, again, with a reminder, is the fact that uh, we're currently in the lowest level of inventory in sort of recorded history, meaning in the last uh, 17 years, which is basically when the NAR started publishing uh, inventory figures. So uh, that bodes really well, because currently home prices are appreciating uh, between 55 and 6% as I showed at a chart early in this deck, uh, and at least based on the analysis we've run, the sort of path of least resistance, it would actually be for that to accelerate up into the high single digits or even uh, into double digits. So then on 23, um, I wanted to spend uh, a minute or two just talking about the demographic uh, dy dynamics that are sort of looking at uh, the housing market here. And obviously, whenever you're talking about demographics, you really have to zoom out because your time scale is now suddenly glacial. Um, it's not trade, it's not trend, it's barely tail, uh, and really it's sort of like beyond tail. Um, so anyway, what is this chart? Uh, there's a couple things that you should pay attention to here. Um, one is there's a little green box sort of, I guess, in the middle offset to the left just a little bit where if you look closely at the top, it says 32 to 33 years of age. Um, those are the people who uh, buy their first home. That's the average age currently of first time home buyers, 32 to 33 years old. So if you're 32 and you're going on 33 and you don't own a house, you're supposed to go get one. Um, now, to the left of that, there are two green columns, and those are 26 and 27 year olds. And those are the people who are currently renting. And the reason we flag that is because the average first time home buyer spends six years renting before they buy a home. So that's why we have these two categories uh, sort of framed up. So what do you do with that information? Well, what we've got in this chart is the number of people in each age cohort. So there are roughly, if you look at the chart, 4.3 million 33 year olds uh, roughly 4.4 million 32-year-olds, but there's like 4.8 million 26-year-olds and the same number of 27-year-olds. So what that means is that over the next five to six years, as those 4.8 million 26 and 27-year-olds become 32 and 33-year-olds, there's going to be a large increase in the number, just the brute force math, the raw number associated uh, with people who want to buy their first home and who buy sort of at least statistical analysis uh, are going to buy their first home for the first time. Um, so uh, long story short, uh, there is a 
large sort of bolus of demand coming down the pike here. Uh, not this year and not next year, but beginning in 2019 and then really rolling through 2020, 21, and 22. Uh, you're going to have quite a housing bull market uh, on your hands as first time buyers really ramp up. Um, on 24, you know, the, the interesting thing about the housing market is you have all these sort of, sort of subcategories, if you will, and uh, one of them is the high end, right? And uh, the high end for the last couple of years had been really conspicuously very weak. Uh, and a lot of it had to do or has to do with this chart here, um, which comes from uh, our macro team and uh, there's a Christian Drake special who co-runs the housing group here with me. And basically on uh, this chart, what I would direct you to is the year 2014. So in 2014, it was the peak in uh, the growth rate for luxury spending, so up 6.5% year over year. That slowed then in 15 uh, down to 4.3. That's also a year in which uh, the high-end housing market began to slow. Uh, and then it really slowed in 2016. So you can see it's up 1% uh, down from up 4% in 2016. In 2016, it was a pretty abysmal year, actually, for high-end real estate in the U.S. Uh, but so far in 2017, these numbers have begun to reaccelerate. So now we're up... Uh, just shy of 5%, and I think that number is actually, since we put this deck together, uh, sped up even further now to 5 to 6%. Um, and not coincidentally, uh, we think, in other words, uh, causally, uh, we're seeing a little bit of a renaissance uh, take hold in the high-end uh, luxury market as well. And if you go to this next page, slide 25, um, you get a little bit of the sort of, you know, I guess, proof in the pudding that this is in fact the case. So. This is a chart uh, that comes from our work on uh, Realogy, uh, the largest U.S. Um, broker uh, of, of real estate. And these guys cater to the high end. And what this chart shows is uh, homes uh, over two and a half million dollars. That's the price at which they're selling uh, the volume uh, of these homes being sold. Uh, so you can see in the first quarter of 2016, the volume was down about nine, 10 percent. Then over the next couple quarters, it was down about 14%. Then it started to get less bad, as we like to say, in the fourth quarter, less bad is good. Uh, and then it actually got really good in the first quarter of 2017. So part of that is obviously comping an easy comp there in the first quarter of last year. Uh, but the point is it's up 10%. And by the way, the next two quarters, second quarter and third quarter, the comps get a lot easier still. Uh, so that's important. So a couple other things to uh, sort of throw out there, um, just, I guess for the, the folks uh, paying attention here is edification. So um, a few negatives. Uh, one of them is actually now in the rearview mirror, but it's worth sort of explaining uh, quickly. Essentially, uh, if you've been paying attention at all to the housing data, um, for the last basically two, three weeks, uh, the housing data has been pretty terrible. And uh, the reason why that's the case has to do with the fact that Easter uh, was in March in 2016, but in 2017 it was in April, where it usually is. Uh, when you go back and analyze um, the seasonality associated with what's called a, a floating Easter, um, the government is supposed to correct for this distortion in their seasonal adjustment factors, uh, but the reality is that their adjustments don't work very well. Um, and that's what this sort of very busy, um, not overly sort of self-obvious uh, chart on 26 is sort of illustrating is that um, basically the government seasonality corrections don't work uh, for Easter when it shifts around by an entire month. Uh, and what that means uh, is that March uh, in the housing market this year looked unnaturally strong. Very, very good. The numbers were great. Uh, and April, correspondingly, looked pretty terrible. Uh, but both of these are a distortion and an illusion. Um, and as we sort of traverse uh, into the sort of release of the May data, the May data should start to look a lot better. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, the next thing to keep in mind with respect to housing from an investment standpoint is this, and this is on slide 28. Housing, more than any sector I've ever looked at in my career, um, is wildly seasonal. And I don't just mean like the fundamental housing market. I mean equity price performance. So on slide 28, we've got this breakdown of where you generate your returns uh, based on which quarter <laughs> you're looking at. So at the top of this table, it shows, uh, so we've got the ITB and XHB, which are the two big housing uh, ETF proxies, and then we've got the S5 home index. And what you can see is that you make 
uh, almost all your money um, by investing in housing equities in the fourth quarter and in the first quarter. Uh, whereas, uh, by contrast, in the second quarter and the third quarter, uh, you generally tend not to make any money or very little. Um, and you can sort of see uh, how the performance has been so far in 17. Uh, you can see how it was in 16. And interestingly, if you go to the next page, we've got sort of the same thing, but instead of looking at six years, now we're looking at 20 years. Uh, and instead of quarterly, now we're looking at monthly. And what you can see is how uh, the performance has been on average by month over these you know, last 20 years. And what this shows is that actually uh, you make most of your money in November, December, January, and February. So uh, where are we now? We're basically at the beginning of June, uh, which on this chart is terrible. So anybody who's sort of thinking about housing from an investment standpoint uh, should be particularly mindful of this chart. It's obviously a frequentist chart. Past performance is no guarantee of future uh, performance. But it is a recurrent thing in housing uh, equities that they tend to do really well in November, December, January, February, and not do as well the rest of the year. And I think the sort of the basis for why that happens tethers back to the property market itself. In other words, what happens is um, in the fall, in the late fall, and obviously through the winter, uh, people sort of, it, we kind of call it this hope springs eternal phenomenon where people get excited that the spring selling season is going to be good. And so they bid the stocks up in advance in anticipation of that. Uh, and then, you know, the classic sort of sell on the news. Once you actually start to see the numbers begin to come in for March and for April and for May, you're out of there. Uh, and that's sort of the, re the recurrent pattern from a performance standpoint. Um, and then I guess one last thing on the next page, uh, and I'll leave it there. You know, one thing that we track very closely, we watch household formation trends. Uh, because ultimately, uh, this is where new incremental demand for housing comes. Uh, it comes from new, newly formed households. Um, and we pull monthly data out of the census website, which isn't easy to do, but uh, we, we do it. And uh, so yeah, we watch uh, real-time uh, household formation. Basically what the census does is actually every month, they uh, call 50,000 households across the US uh, to create a statistically representative sample. Uh, to come up with these numbers. And so they're pretty good. They're pretty timely. Um, and they comport with historical reality, i.e., if you go back and look at the Great Recession, 2008, 2009, and into 2010, obviously household formation levels were extremely depressed during that time frame. Uh, and the reason I show this chart and bring this topic up is that for reasons that are not entirely clear, for the last two months, uh, the household formation uh, numbers have been extremely weak. Uh, we don't know why, we don't know if that is sort of a temporary uh, aberration. Uh, but uh, between you know, this and what's happening from a seasonality or what happens from a seasonality standpoint most years, uh, it, these are a few factors to kind of keep in mind from an intermediate term standpoint. So uh, taking a step back, the bigger picture uh, remains very conducive for the ongoing recovery in the housing market uh, over the longer term. Uh, however, in the short to intermediate term, uh, there are a few things to uh, be keeping in mind uh, as cross currents. So uh, with that, I'll, uh, I'll hand it over to you, Chris. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. All right. I think now we have uh, some rapid fire questions. All right. So what is your favorite short? Uh, well, um, most of the U.S. housing market uh, I like. Um, there is, however, an area that I think is interesting, and it's actually north of the border, and that's uh, the Canadian housing market, which I think is going to become a hot mess uh, over the coming sort of one to two years. I know it's a long time, but basically they've had a bull market there cooking for about 26 years. So uh, yeah, um, basically, by any sort of objective fundamental measure, uh, the Canadian property market is uh, wildly overvalued, uh, definitely in bubble territory. And uh, I think what we're sort of waiting and watching for is uh, indications that volume is beginning to roll in that market. And uh, volume actually is already beginning to roll. Uh, it started rolling last fall in Vancouver, and it's now rolling as of roughly a month ago in uh, Toronto, this is the other uh, major market in Canada. So. That's uh, probably my favorite area right now on the short side. All right, what, is your, what would your favorite long be then? 
Well, in the U.S., um, you know, the name that we think is sort of at an interesting inflection point, uh, as I sort of briefly mentioned in the deck, is Realogy. So Realogy is the largest uh, broker in the U.S. Um, they, as I pointed out, really cater to the high end. Uh, and for essentially up until about six months ago, the high end spent really kind of two, two and a half years in the desert uh, where performance was brutal, uh, nothing was really going uh, very well. Um, and now things are you know, starting to inflect. So at first they got less bad, uh, now they're actually getting good. Uh, so yeah, Realogy is uh, a name that we like. Awesome. Uh, will we have another housing bubble as epic as 2008? Ever. Ever. It's well, kind of an open-ended question. Yeah, but. obviously we will. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you have to go back a long ways, right? You'd have to go back to the Great Depression uh, to get to a period where the housing market performed worse than it did in 2008, 2009, 2010. Um, and so, I don't think we're in store for anything like that for a really, really long time. Um, now, you know, roughly every 10 to 20 years, you do get a little bit of a housing market correction or even a material housing correction. So I think the, you know, the general way to think about these things is that the deeper the scars left by the most recent uh, asset uh, correction, um, you know, the longer it's going to be, A, and probably the milder. Uh, it's going to be B, uh, the magnitude of the downturn uh, that comes on the heels of it. So given where we're coming from, uh, I think it'll be like, usually in order to have a housing correction, you need underwriting to get pretty sloppy and you need prices to get way ahead of themselves. And neither of those things are going on. Uh, so yeah, I don't, uh, I don't think we'll see a housing uh, bubble or correction for a long time. Let's pick up the, uh, the tempo on the last couple ones. Is labor the most important macro factor that impacts housing? It is, yeah. Um, we actually had that chart in the deck about midway through that showed uh, 50 years of data. Um, every time there's been a housing correction, it's been uh, coincident with uh, a labor market deterioration. However, just because you have a labor market deterioration doesn't mean you have to have a housing correction. All right, let's see. Do you think there will be an, a new peak in existing home sales within the decade? Well, yeah, we're making new peaks every year, um, and I wouldn't expect that to change. I mean, I think this inventory constraint is going to slow the rate of growth in the existing home market from a volume standpoint. Uh, but you know, the reality is that um, I showed where mortgage credit availability is, and it's only about halfway back to normal. So every year, that's going to keep getting a little bit easier and a little bit easier, and that's going to bring more people out of the woodwork to buy homes. So as long as inventory cooperates, existing home sales will keep going up. All right. Um, is housing cheap historically versus income? Yeah. Um, I had a chart in here that basically showed that. So basically, uh, housing sort of oscillates uh, on an income basis uh, between 20 and 40 percent of your income is spent on your mortgage. And 20 being the low end, obviously, 40 being uh, sort of extreme, you know, bubble territory, uh, and we're at about 26. What is the hottest U.S. market right now? Uh, Seattle. So Seattle is up, I think, 13% year over year, uh, which makes it the fastest major uh, metro in the country. And actually, if you look at the three-month rate of change in the year over year rate of change, Seattle's actually accelerating. So not only is it up double digits year over year, uh, that rate of appreciation is actually speeding up. So definitely Seattle. What about north of the border? Uh, north of the border, well, it's interesting actually. So um, part of the reason Seattle is so strong is because Vancouver has slowed down a lot. So back in August of last year, uh, the British Columbian government passed a foreign buyer tax in Vancouver of 15%, which was mainly aimed at uh, mainland Chinese buyers uh, coming over to Canada to buy uh, Vancouver property. And as soon as that tax uh, was imposed, you saw volumes in Vancouver drop uh, by 30 to 40 percent, an enormous decline. Um, for context, the U.S., when it peaked in 2005 to when it troughed in 2009, it declined 40 percent. So Vancouver had that happen practically overnight. Um, and a lot of that money basically just flowed around Vancouver to the east into Toronto, uh, 
and to the south into Seattle and into Portland. So that's part of why Seattle is such a strong market right now. Um, and then Toronto had been speeding up, um, but Toronto just passed its own tax uh, for what's called the Golden Horseshoe region, uh, which is all of the greater Toronto area all the way down to the U.S. border. Um, and that just went into effect, I think, April 21st, so about a month or I guess six weeks now. Uh, and we're already getting indications that Toronto volumes are down in the mid to high teens year over year. So uh, that's basically what's happening north of the border. Awesome. Thanks for the color. All right, we have quite a few questions in the queue. Let's get through a couple of these. Um, what is the biggest risk to your bullish thesis on Realogy? Yeah, I think um, on Realogy, uh, it would be a couple of things. Um, one is that, you know, quite frankly, uh, Realogy, in my view, doesn't have the most dynamic management team. Um, so, yeah, I mean, these guys have not had the best track record of sort of properly setting expectations and beating them. Um, I think fundamentally um, there's some sort of like execution risks coupled with some sort of bigger picture, more existential risks. Um, on the execution front, it's really more about the idea, I'm not worried about sort of growing volume and prices growing and that sort of thing. I'm more worried about commission splits and uh, how much they have to pay to sort of retain their good producers, um, how much they have to pay to attract new good producers because they've been losing a lot of their top talent or had been for a number of years. They've sort of fixed that, uh, but that's going to be sort of an ongoing concern. Um, I think the bigger sort of picture, more existential crisis, and this isn't sort of anything terribly new or profound, but it's, it's real. Um, there's a lot of concern that if you look at um, the disruptive power of technology, uh, basically the Ubers and Airbnbs and sort of, you know, these companies that have come in and basically just, you know, shaken up existing industries um, through technology and empowerment. Uh, the idea is that, you know, the sort of traditional model of an agent selling real estate is like a dinosaur business that is beyond ripe for disruption. and. Uh, one day we're all going to sort of wake up and everything's going to transact over Zillow and it's, you know, no longer going to, we're no longer going to need an, an agent for any of this. Um, and I think, you know, there's so, sort of some embedded truth to the logic of that. Um, however, uh, at least empirically, um, you know, the threat of disruptive technology has been around for a long time. And during that span of time, uh, there hasn't really been any encroachment on this business. So if you look at uh, the percentage of homes sold through uh, an agent, uh, it's gone up, not down. It's gone basically from like the low 80s up to the high 80s, so like 88, 89% of people who uh, buy and sell real estate uh, in the US use an agent. And, um, and so, I, look, I think you know, the main sort of moat, if you will, competitively is uh, the MLS, right? Which basically is uh, the pr proprietary property of uh, the NAR, and anybody who's not sort of a you know, fully baked broker can't get access to it, and ultimately that's proved to be a sufficient barrier to entry uh, for would-be sort of discount brokers, technology players, basically lots of people have come out of the woodwork and tried to sort of chip away at, uh, at this, this moat, and nobody's been successful so far. Do you think there are any dark, uh, dark spots in the housing market we need to look out for? Um, dark spots. I think certain markets are definitely uh, very rich from a valuation standpoint. So you can look at the Bay Area, you can look at uh, Manhattan, uh, you can look certainly at a lot of these higher end markets that have just been on an absolute tear from a price performance standpoint really over the last sort of seven, eight years. Uh, and you can point to overvaluation in some of these markets, whether it's on price to rent or price to income. Um, so I definitely think that there's, you know, there, a lot less complacency, frankly, is warranted in some of those uh, hot spot markets. Um, but, you know, again, we tend to take a national view. We try to look at the market holistically and uh, at the national level, things still look quite good. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's definitely pockets uh, of the country that, you know, the, the big difference, right, is that 
the norm is when you have a real estate correction, it tends to be regional, right? What was so sort of profound about 2007, 2008, 2009 was that it was basically national. It affected numerous states, numerous markets, um, and that was pretty unprecedented. You'd have to go, again, back to the Great Depression to find a comparable period when that was uh, the case. Um, and so, anyway, I, what wouldn't surprise me would be if we had these sort of episodic regional uh, real estate retreats. Um, but, you know, are we going to get another sort of big national bloodbath like the one we had 10 years ago? Probably not for a long time. Awesome. Great. Um, is housing investment still at decade, decade lows? Yeah, is housing investment still at decade lows? Uh, I'm not crystal clear on what that means, but I think if I understand the question correctly, um, well, no, it's not at decade lows. I mean, we had this chart in here that basically so showed um, housing construction, and the gist of it is that uh, the peak in housing starts is around 2 million historically at the top of the cycle, uh, and it's tended to trough anywhere from eight, 900,000, um, and we're currently at 1.1 million, going on 1.2 million. So, you know, we're a little above the trough. Uh, we're still a long way to go from the peak. So we're not at decade lows, but we have a long way to go. All right. Um, are there any interesting demographic dynamics that are driving housing today? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I think you've got demographic dynamics at both ends of the spectrum. You've got uh, millennials, um, which people talk about endlessly. Um, I think we showed the chart in here that shows the average age of the first-time buyers, 32 to 33. Uh, we show the number of people who are each age cohort uh, and who are going to be uh, coming down the pike here, notably those who are 26, 27, because on average they rent for six years. Uh, so we have a pretty good idea of what the uh, demand uh, pipeline looks like over the coming four, five, six years. At the other end of the spectrum, uh, you have boomers, uh, and boomers are retiring in increasing numbers. And so uh, normally uh, people start to begin to think about retirement in their mid-60s. Uh, so you can basically watch the numbers of people who are going to be moving uh, through uh, their early 60s into their mid 60s, and those numbers are going to go way up. So you're going to have a lot of sort of larger homes that are going to be coming up for sale. Um, and I think the real sort of challenge for the housing market is going to be uh, how do you sort of simultaneously accommodate uh, the step up in demand for entry level homes on the part of first time buyers? while at the same time um, absorbing all of that uh, sort of large uh, McMansion-esque uh, empty nest property uh, being s sold or put on offer uh, by retiring boomers looking to downsize and move to generally warmer climates. So. All right, I think, what was it, the first quarter theme call or fourth quarter theme call that you guys did? You had a picture of a millennial sitting in a box with Wi-Fi? Yeah. Yep. Um, all right, there's two more questions from north of the border, uh, and we can wrap it up. It's, uh, what is Canada's income to mortgage ratio? Income to mortgage ratio. Okay. Um, yeah, we have all that data off the top of my head. I don't have that number in my mind, so we can uh, send over a chart on that. All right, and then will the uh, HCG mess spread into the five majors in Canada? Yeah, I mean, that's the big question, right? Is home capital uh, an indication? So HCG is this uh, Canadian lender, home capital group, um, that basically uh, in the span of about five days um, had sort of a classic bank run. Uh, basically, deposit flight, um, complete lack of confidence, stock price collapse, that reinforced deposit flight. Um, anyway, so the big question with home capital is, um, is it a canary in the coal mine uh, that the housing market there is beginning to really roll over, or is it sort of this one-off isolated event? And uh, again, the way we approach Canada and thinking about sort of the Canadian uh, housing idea and trade is that, you know, we watch volume uh, because volume leads price and price leads delinquency and delinquency ultimately is what matters to lenders, uh, the big, big six actually in Canada. So. Um, the way that we look at it is we watch for breakpoints in volume, and as I mentioned, Vancouver's been rolling over since last August, and Toronto's just started rolling over in the last month. And so, you know, 
I mean, that's, that's about as strong a leading indicator as, as you can get. And uh, we'll obviously watch that closely. And we would expect that price will follow through on a lag, as it normally does. Uh, so yeah, that's basically what we're looking for. I, you know, I think people who are sort of, I think both people are a little bit mistaken. In other words, there's two camps. There's the home capital camp that says, this is absolutely you know, a watershed moment that is proof that the housing uh, complex in Canada is beginning to crumble. Uh, and then you've got sort of the you know, defenders, if you will, who say that it's completely home capital related. They're, they had idiosyncratic problems. It's not at all indicative of what's going on. And I think with most, thing, most things, the truth is somewhere in the middle, right? So um, anyway, that's how we think about Canada. That's what we're watching for. Awesome. That's all the questions we have for today. Thank you for coming on. Great. Uh, thank you for tuning in. We hope we're able to provide some valuable insights. Please join us next Tuesday at 2.30 for another Sector Spotlight.